the 20th of July, 1944. Just a few hours after German military officers attempt to assassinate Adolf Hitler at the Wolf's Lair, his East Prussian headquarters at Rustenburg, the Führer keeps his appointments including a meeting with Italy's fascist leader, Benito Mussolini. The plot was the culmination of efforts by several groups in the German resistance, which hoped that Hitler's violent death would signal an anti-Nazi revolt and overthrow the Nazi German government. The Führer, however, survived the blast, and the coup attempt failed. In the days that followed, Adolf Hitler ordered a massive hunt for conspirators, which continued for months. In the end, more than 7,000 people were arrested, and many of the conspirators appeared before the notorious People's Court for show trials, which condemned thousands of Germans to death, often on the barest evidence. Its president was a fanatical Nazi judge, Roland Freisler. Roland Freisler was born on the 30th of October, 1893, in Celle, then part of the German Empire, as a son of an engineer and teacher, Julius Freisler, and his wife Charlotte. Roland and his two brothers were baptized as Protestants. When the First World War began, on the 28th of July, 1914, Freisler was studying law at the University of Jena. He interrupted his studies and enlisted as an officer cadet in the German army. By 1915, he was a lieutenant, and for gallantry in action, he was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class. In October the same year, Freisler was taken prisoner of war by the Russians on the Eastern Front and was interned in the officers' camp near Moscow. Although the prisoners were released home in 1918, Freisler stayed in Soviet Russia until 1919. He learned to speak fluent Russian, and it is believed that he was a staunch supporter of Bolshevism at the time. In 1919, Freisler returned to Germany to complete his law studies at the University of Jena, and in 1922 he qualified as a doctor of law. In July 1925, Freisler joined the Nazi party. He immediately gained authority within the organization by using his legal training to defend its members, who were regularly facing prosecutions for acts of political violence. From 1924 to 1935, he often traveled to Leipzig and stood as a lawyer before the Leipzig Court of Honor. Even though, in almost all of the trials, he insulted and threatened colleagues, victims or judges, his license to practice law was never revoked. In 1927, Karl Weinrich, a Nazi member of the Prussian parliament along with Freisler, characterized his then reputation in the rapidly expanding Nazi movement in the late 1920s. Rhetorically, Freisler is equal to our best speakers, if not superior, particularly on the broad masses he has influence, but thinking people mostly reject him. Party comrade Freisler is usable only as a speaker though, and is unsuitable for any position of authority because of his unreliability and moodiness. On the 24th of March, 1928, Freisler married Marian Rossiger. The marriage produced two sons. After Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party came into power in January 1933, Freisler became a member of the Reichstag, the German parliament. He was also appointed ministerial director in the Prussian Ministry of Justice, as well as Secretary of State in the Prussian and Reich Ministry of Justice. On the founding of the Academy for German Law by Hans Frank, who later became head of the general government in Nazi-occupied Poland during the Second World War, Freisler was made a member and the chairman of its criminal law committee. The Academy was charged with promoting reform of German legal life by working in liaison with legislative bodies to implement the National Socialist Program in the fields of law and economics. Freisler's mastery of legal texts, mental agility, dramatic courtroom verbal dexterity, and verbal force, in combination with his zealous conversion to Nazi ideology, made him the most feared judge in Nazi Germany and the personification of Nazism in domestic law. However, despite his talents and loyalty, Adolf Hitler never appointed him to any post beyond the legal system. The reason was not only that he was a lone figure, lacking support within the senior ranks of the Nazi hierarchy, but also because he had been politically compromised by his brother, Oswald Freisler, also a lawyer. Oswald had acted as a defense counsel against the regime's authority several times in politically significant trials, which the Nazis sought to use for propaganda purposes and he had the habit of wearing his Nazi party membership badge in court whilst doing so, which led to confusion over the party's role in the trials. Propaganda minister Josef Goebbels reproached Oswald Freisler and reported his actions to Adolf Hitler, who in response ordered Oswald Freisler's expulsion from the party. In 1939, Oswald Freisler mysteriously committed suicide in Berlin after he had been accused of irregularities in the conduct of a defense. 
Freisler was a committed Nazi ideologist and used his legal skills to adapt his theories into practical lawmaking and judicature. He published a paper entitled The Racial Biological Task Involved in the Reform of Juvenile Criminal Law, in which he argued that racially foreign, racially degenerate, racially incurable, or seriously defective juveniles should be sent to juvenile centers or correctional education centers and segregated from those who are German and racially valuable. He also strongly advocated for the creation of laws to punish so-called race defilement, which was the Nazi term for sexual relations between Aryans and those deemed as inferior races. In 1933, he even published a pamphlet calling for the legal prohibition of mixed blood sexual intercourse. Freisler's ideological views reflected things to come, as two years later, on the 15th of September 1935, the Nazi regime announced two new laws. The Reich Citizenship Law, which defined a citizen as a person who is of German or related blood, which meant that Jews, defined as a separate race, could not be full citizens of Germany and had no political rights and the law for the protection of German blood and German honor, which banned future intermarriages and sexual relations between Jews and people of German or related blood. The Nazis believed that such relationships were dangerous because they led to mixed-race children. According to the Nazis, these children and their descendants undermined the purity of the German race. World War II started on the 1st of September 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. In the following month, Freisler introduced the concept of precocious juvenile criminal in the Juvenile Felons Decree. This decree provided the legal basis for imposing the death penalty and penitentiary terms on juveniles for the first time in German legal history. At least 72 German juveniles were sentenced to death by the Nazi courts. Two years later, in 1941, when Goebbels suggested to appoint Roland Freisler to replace Franz Gertner, the Reich Minister of Justice who had died, Hitler's reply, referring to Freisler's alleged red past, was, that old Bolshevik, no. On the 20th of January, 1942, 15 high-ranking Nazi party and German government officials gathered at the villa in the Berlin suburb of Anze to discuss and coordinate the implementation of what they called the final solution of the Jewish question. The final solution was the codename for the systematic, deliberate, and physical annihilation of the European Jews. Adolf Hitler had authorized this European-wide scheme for mass murder at some still undetermined time in 1941. At the time of this Wannsee conference, most participants were already aware that the Nazi regime had engaged in mass murder of Jews and other civilians in the German-occupied areas of the Soviet Union and in Serbia. None of the officials present at the meeting, including Roland Freisler, who was to provide expert legal advice for the plan, objected to the final solution policy that Heydrich announced. Heydrich indicated that the approximately 11 million Jews in Europe would fall under the provisions of the final solution. In this figure, he included not only Jews residing in Axis-controlled Europe, but also the Jewish populations of the United Kingdom and the neutral nations such as Switzerland, Ireland, Sweden, Spain, Portugal, and European Turkey. On the 20th of August, 1942, Hitler named Freisler President of the People's Court. He chaired the first Senate of the People's Court, wearing a blood-scarlet judicial robe, in a hearing chamber bedecked with scarlet swastika-draped banners, and a large black sculpted bust of Adolf Hitler's head upon a high pedestal behind his chair, opening each hearing session with a Nazi salute from the bench. He acted as prosecutor, judge, and jury combined. Under Freisler's rule, the frequency of death sentences rose sharply. Approximately 90% of all cases that came before him ended in guilty verdicts. Between 1942 and 1945, more than 5,000 death sentences were decreed by him. 2,600 of these through the court's first Senate, which Freisler controlled. He was responsible in his three years on the court for as many death sentences as all other Senate sessions of the court combined in the court's existence between 1934 and 1945. Therefore, he soon acquired the reputation of a blood judge. In all processes of the People's Court, Freisler showed a pronounced bias in favor of the Nazi state and its ideology. His conduct of the case went beyond the rules of procedure and the code of conduct for judges, and accordingly represented a serious form of perverting the law. As a fanatical National Socialist, he said that he wanted a judge as the Führer himself would judge the case. Freisler's loud screaming made it difficult for sound engineers to record answers from the accused. 
In trials, he sometimes shouted so much that the sensitivity of the microphones had to be set to a correspondingly lower level. Chemische Erzeugung haben keine Ahnung von Chemie. Wenn Sie lieber eine Knarre in die Hand genommen, wäre ich auf dumme Gedanken gekommen. Aber natürlich, Sie haben ja bestätigt, dass Sie KV sind. Also, und werden Sie hier nicht unverschämt. For Freisler, the People's Court was expressly a political court. In the trials, he humiliated the accused, hardly listened to them, and kept interrupting them. He also yelled at them and conducted the process in a particularly unobjective manner. This deliberate and targeted humiliation of the accused happened both verbally by Freisler himself and in a nonverbal way. For instance, the Nazis gave defendants old, oversized and beltless clothing, and because they had to stand in front of the court, they were forced to constantly hold up their trousers. When on the 18th of February, 1943, Hans and Sophie Scholl were distributing leaflets at the Ludwig Maximilian University, they were reported to the official secret police of Nazi Germany, the Gestapo, and then arrested. Through questioning, it became clear that the two siblings were part of a resistance group called the White Rose, which wrote the leaflets, each being more critical of Hitler and the German people than the last. They encouraged citizens to resist the Nazi regime, denounced the murder of hundreds of thousands of Poles, and demanded an end to the war. Under interrogation, Sophie was offered a reduced sentence if she would admit that her brother had led her astray. But she refused, saying, I won't betray my brother or my principles. I'll make no bargain with the Nazis. On the 22nd of February, 1943, Freisler was flown into Munich for the sole purpose of presiding over their trial. Appearing in the courtroom, Sophie Scholl shocked everyone when she remarked to Freisler, somebody after all had to make a start. What we wrote and said is also believed by many others. They just don't dare express themselves as we did. She also interrupted Freisler with a statement, you know the war is lost. Why don't you have the courage to face it? After a half-day trial, the verdict was as expected. Guilty. Freisler had sentenced them to death by hanging, but fearful of them being raised to martyrdom status if they were publicly killed, it was decided to kill them by guillotine. On the 19th of April, 1943, Freisler was flown back again to stand as judge over the second trial of the White Rose members. In the second trial, Freisler yelled at the accused right at the opening, saying, National Socialism does not need a criminal code against such traitors as you are. I will make this process with you short. When an assessor handed him the penal code, without a word, Freisler immediately threw it in the direction of the dock, where the accused had to duck to avoid being hit in the head. Out of the 13 defendants, three were sentenced to death. Nine were given prison sentences, and one was unexpectedly acquitted. Another of Freisler's victims was Elfriede Scholz, a sister of German-born novelist Erich Maria Remarque. On the 10th of May, 1933, at the initiative of the Nazi propaganda minister Josef Goebbels, Remarque's writing was publicly declared as unpatriotic and was banned in Germany. As a result, copies were removed from all libraries and restricted from being sold or published anywhere in the country. While Erich left Germany, his sister Elfrida did not. She stayed behind in Germany with her husband and two children, and was arrested after her landlord had overheard a remark in which Elfrida stated the Nazi-driven war was lost and turned her over to the Nazi party. The charge against her was undermining Germany's war effort. During the trial, Freisler told Elfrida, Your brother is beyond our reach, but you will not escape us. Elfriede Schultz was beheaded by guillotine on the 16th of December, 1943. On the 20th of July, 1944, after a failed bomb attempt to assassinate Hitler on his airplane, Klaus von Stauffenberg and other conspirators attempted to assassinate Adolf Hitler inside his Wolfslayer field headquarters. The conspirators focused on an existing contingency plan codenamed Operation Valkyrie. This operation was originally designed to militarily combat potential civil unrest in Germany, and the conspirators modified the plan for their own aims, with the intention of taking control of German cities, disarming the SS, and arresting key Nazi leaders in the wake of the plot. Motivations varied widely, and should not be viewed solely in the context of the Holocaust, as a number of the conspirators themselves were implicated in both war crimes and the Holocaust. For many of the conspirators, the attempted assassination had a more pragmatic objective, to rescue Germany from a catastrophic defeat brought about by Hitler's increasingly irrational management of the war. 
In the days that followed, Hitler ordered a massive hunt for conspirators, which continued for months. In August 1944, some of the arrested perpetrators of the failed assassination were brought before Freisler for punishment. Hitler had ordered that those found guilty should be hanged like cattle. The proceedings were filmed in order to be shown to the German public in cinema newsreels and portray how Freisler ran his court, as he would often alternate between questioning the defendants in an analytical manner and then suddenly launching into a furious verbal tirade, even going so far as to shout insults at the accused from the bench. The shift from cold, clinical interrogation to fits of screaming rage was designed to psychologically disarm, torment, and humiliate those on trial while discouraging any attempt on their part to either defend or justify their actions. At one point, Freisler yelled at Field Marshal Erwin von Witzleben, who was trying to hold up his trousers after having purposely been given old, oversized and beltless clothing. You dirty old man, why do you keep fiddling with your trousers? However, the defendants never lost their dignity. The closing words that Erwin von Witzleben addressed to Freisler are said to have been, You can hand us over to the executioner. In three months, the outraged and tormented people will hold you accountable and drag you alive through the mud of the streets. Caesar von Hofacker, a leading figure of the resistance in France, interrupted Freisler after he had interrupted him several times, saying, you are silent now, Herr Freisler, because today is about my head. In a year, it's all about your head. When Freisler sarcastically pictured General Erich Felgebel's impending death, Felgebel told Freisler, Then hurry up, Mr. President, otherwise you'll hang up before we do. When Ulrich Wilhelm, Count Schwerin von Schwanenfeld, ravaged by the conditions of his detention, was brought to court without a belt and tie, he as well tried to preserve his dignity. He stated that his opposition to Hitler was due to the many murders in Germany and abroad. He was constantly interrupted by a furious Freisler, who finally shouted him down in a rage and told him, You really are a lousy piece of trash. In the end, more than 7,000 people were arrested. 4,980 of them, including von Witzleben, von Hofacker, Count Schwerin von Schwanenfeld, and General Felgebel were executed, often on the barest evidence. Some of the executions were carried out within two hours of the verdict being delivered. However, justice finally caught up with Freisler in February 1945. There are two contradictory accounts of the circumstances of Freisler's death. On the morning of the 3rd of February 1945, Freisler was conducting a Saturday session of the People's Court when the United States Army Air Force bombers attacked Berlin. Government and Nazi buildings were hit, including the Reich Chancellery, the Gestapo headquarters, the Party Chancellery, and the People's Court. Hearing the air raid sirens, Freisler hastily adjourned the court and ordered that the prisoners before him be taken to an air raid shelter, but he himself then stayed behind to gather case files before leaving. A bomb struck the court building at 11.08, causing a partial internal collapse, and a masonry column came loose whilst Freisler was distracted by his documents. The column came crashing down on Freisler, causing him to be crushed and instantly killed. Due to the column collapsing, a large portion of the courtroom also landed on Freisler's corpse. The crushed and flattened remains of Freisler were found beneath the rubble, still clutching the files he had stayed behind to gather. But a differing account stated that Freisler, then 51 years old, was killed by a bomb fragment while trying to escape his court to the air raid shelter. He then bled to death on the pavement outside the People's Court in Berlin. Louisa von Bender, General Alfred Jodl's wife, recounted more than 25 years later that she had been working at the Lutzow Hospital when Freisler's body was brought in. Upon seeing Freisler's body, one hospital worker commented, It is God's verdict. Not one person said a word in reply. Freisler's body was then buried in the grave of his wife's family in Berlin. His name is not recorded on the tombstone. There were no tears shed for Roland Freisler. Thanks for watching the World History Channel and don't miss our next videos. Click the subscribe button now for more interesting clips. Give us a like and see you in the following episode.